Welcome, everybody. I'm Brian Pupa, Executive Director with the Legacy Project. Uh, we always start with a little perspective in time and place. Uh, scientists tell us that there are more stars in the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches and deserts in the world. So here we are in an immense universe that's roughly 13.7 billion years old, surrounded by billions and billions of sparkling stars on this tiny blue dot we call Earth in the intriguing vision of a country called Canada. I'm coming to you from the greater Toronto area, specifically our site, the Cedars, at the headwaters of the Beaver River, on the traditional indigenous territories of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeg, and Mississaugas of Scugog Island. We gather in the spirit of being in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, doing the right thing. Uh, this session is titled Seven Generation Bioregional Planning for People and Planet in a Poly Crisis. It's clear that we are in a poly crisis converging climate, environmental, economic, political, technological, social, health. And there are no simple solutions, and, and this session doesn't propose to offer any. This is about designing a pathway forward with a new understanding of current local and global challenges. The seven generation work in the greater Toronto bioregion is part of the first North American cohort of a global bioregional activators network. This is an opportunity for us here in the GTB to both lead and learn from other bioregions around the world. Seven generation GTB draws on the seminal 1992 report that the Honorable David Crombie completed and he called it regeneration. Uh, and it was a groundbreaking report, um, was one of the things that eventually led to the creation of the Green Belt here. And he defined, he defined in his report, the Greater Toronto Bioregion, as bounded by the Niagara Escarpment on the west, the Oak Ridges Moraine, Lake Simcoe to the north, and uh, the Oak Ridges Moraine to the east and Lake Ontario to the south. And uh, we're very honored that both David Crombie and the Honorable Pauline uh, Brose, former federal minister of the environment, are serving as honorary ambassadors for seven generation GTB. At this point, I'll bring in a researcher, educator, and founder of the Legacy Project, Susan Bosak. I'm very happy to see everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, context is everything, so I can give you a little bit of context this afternoon. The Legacy Project is a research, education, and social innovation group. We've been at this for 20 years. Through that 20 years, we've done a lot of research and development for the seven-generation work with funding from United Way, from Trillium, and now from ESDC for two years to create a core team for this bioregional work. We find ourselves in a moment of both coherence and opportunity. The work that we do is systems complexity, which means a couple of things. It means, first of all, you may not completely understand what this is all about in today's session, which is fine because it is complexity and there's no way to understand the breadth and depth of the work in a two hour session. The other thing is you might wonder, well, really, is this like for me? Is it my thing? It is your thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have invited you. It's your thing connected to everybody else's thing. There's a dynamic there. We're connecting environment and climate, health, education, all the way up to Indigenous worldviews and knowledge. This is really a big three-dimensional game of connect the dots. And we're looking at the relationships and the movements between all those dots in the constellation that we call the Greater Toronto Area, the Greater Toronto Bioregion. A lot of times when you hear about systems work, you hear people talking about levers that, you know, if, if you can move the lever, the thing about a lever is it needs energy. Otherwise, you can move it all you want. If it's not powered, if there's not energy, you're not going to get where you need to go. So we talk about systems dynamics in the work that we do, and we're using two systems dynamics. The first dynamic that we're using is an intergenerational dynamic. This is a really profound, really basic generational kind of force. The anthropologist Margaret Mead once said that 
Connections between generations are essential for the mental health and stability of nations. Now that's a pretty big statement, the mental health and stability of nations. And in indigenous cultures, they say that if you want to get something done, that what you need to do is bring together a fired up youth with a feisty granny, that you need that dynamic. This relationship is foundational to humanity. There is comfort and well-being to be found in that relationship at a very basic level in a time of uncertainty, but there is also power and there is also insight. And this is a very profound way to get into communities at a grassroots level that avoids a lot of the polarization that we're seeing right now. So that dynamic is really important. The other dynamic is place. And we're approaching that, an understanding of place in a very specific way. And that's why we have Joe Brewer talking to us today about bioregion. The intergenerational and place-based dynamics ground the work and give it energy in ways that can affect both leadership and policy, and also people in community. So this is a two-ended approach to systems innovation. Seven Generation GTB is about social regeneration, and by that we mean generations in community, and it's also about ecological regeneration, community in bioregion because the two have to go hand in hand. So often we say, this is sustainability work, this is human services work. And we realize that that's only half of the equation, that you have to bring them together. And this work is challenging itself to try and take on that complexity. We're doing a complex dance between mitigation, adaptation, and seeds. Again, this is both broad and deep systems work, and it's unusual because it's not work that's usually done. In a world of hyperbole, I don't know how to explain how important and how vital this is. I mean, it is the best thing since sliced bread. It really is. This could fundamentally affect how we move forward in the GTA, how we connect to the Great Lakes Basin, how we connect to the continent, how we connect to the planet. Yesterday, we did an amazing intergenerational session with Joe Brewer. And afterward, for a documentary we're doing, we uh, recorded a conversation between Joe Brewer and Dr. Dan Longboat. And Dan is a Turtle Clan member of the Mohawk Nation. He's an associate professor at Trent, founding director of the Indigenous Environmental Science and Studies Program. There weren't a lot of people in the room because it was we were just doing it for the documentary. But I can tell you that the people in that room felt something very profound. There, there was something happened. Joe and Dan went back and forth about finding a third way, bringing together Western scientific knowledge with indigenous worldviews and knowledge and finding a pathway forward, a third way forward. And I don't wanna give away too much, but I can tell you they did find common ground. They did find the beginnings of a third way forward. So I would like to introduce our guest speaker. He is a transdisciplinary scholar with a background of both earth sciences and cognitive sciences, because you do need both if you want to make real change in the world. He's an inspiring speaker, a leading edge complexity thinker. He's doing on the ground work regenerating 500,000 hectares in Barichara, Colombia. He's also working to build this global network um, of bioregions. He's founder of the Design Institute for Regenerating Earth and author of the Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. So I am very pleased to turn it over to someone that I respect both for his intellect and his integrity, Joe Brewer. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I am completely like humbled and honored to be in your landscape, in your territory. And yesterday, talking with Dan Longboat was just uh, such a special gift. I can't wait till the video is ready to be able to share with all of you. Um, because he is just an incredibly deep, wise human being representing the Iroquois nation with incredible capacity. And what I wanna talk with you all today about is um, I want us to explore sort of two related themes. And one of them is 
how do we deal with systemic risk and systemic complexity in a world that is filled with, with risks and challenges because of all of the interdependencies of what we're dealing with in the world today? And then I want to shift gears and explore how we can create holistic, systemic, not so much solutions, but pathways for bringing everything together in a coherent way to continually evolve it into the future. And so what I'm going to do in just a moment is start a slideshow, where in the beginning of the slideshow, I'll go into some of the systemic risks that exist in the Earth system as a whole, and in the human systems within it to start to show some of the challenges in the level of the wicked problem and the, the predicaments that we need to deal with right now. And then move from that into an exploration of what I consider to be a design pathway forward that is capable of holding all of that complexity and beginning to grapple with it and increasingly to manage it effectively. And so with that in mind, I'd love to begin the presentation part of today's discussion. And I've given the talk a title that is slightly different from what was um, on the description for the presentation or for the event, um, but it's very much related. And what I want to do is I want to explore how we manage the complexities of systemic collapse, because there are many kinds of systemic collapse that we are all living with and right now, and how this exploration of the complexity of systemic collapse opens us up into a design pathway for regenerating the entire planet for the whole earth. And to begin this conversation, I wanna start with something very important, which is this. If we look at the earth from space, you'll notice that there are no lines, no boundaries, no walls, there's no separation. Everything is completely integrated. And if you just look at the movement of water, in this picture, you can see that there's liquid water in the ocean, there are clouds in the sky, there are coastal estuaries, rivers and lakes in the inland parts of the continents. It's all connected. It's all one vast complex system. And so part of our time today, we'll be talking about insights that can be drawn from Earth system science to help us understand how the entire planet is an interdependent web of evolving complexity. And now that reveals very powerful and very important challenges for us as human beings in the world today. So with that in mind, what we're gonna talk about in the first half of this talk is some of the breakdowns that are occurring right now in the earth system and how they can lead to cascading shocks in human systems, which produce very difficult, wicked problems and systemic risks. And then I'm going to suggest that a way of managing these breakdowns and cascading shocks is by understanding the role of regenerative bioregions as a holistic mindset for approaching the cultivation of systemic resilience, the resilience that we need to navigate the breakdowns and shocks that are occurring. So with that said, I wanna begin with a very powerful framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which is a community of more than 3,500 Earth system scientists. And they created a, a, a framework called Planetary Boundaries. The way that this framework came into being was that in 2000, 2009, a question was asked. The question was, with everything we know about the dynamic Earth, are there any thresholds or limits that if we were to cross them, that the prospects for a global economy and a globalized uh, civilization becomes tenuous and may not be possible. So they started gathering knowledge from the earth system that they knew at the time, and they identified that there are indeed nine planetary boundaries, meaning that if you crossed even one of them, that the prospect for a globalized civilization is called into question. Those nine planetary boundaries are climate change, which is only one of the nine, biosphere integrity, which is the loss of species and the loss of biodiversity, land system change, which is taking complex ecosystems and degrading and simplifying them by turning them into urban landscapes, into agriculture or other kinds of, uh, of degradation of land, fresh water use, biogeochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen associated with industrial agriculture, ocean acidification, atmospheric aerosol loading, which is just another way of saying air pollution, 
stratospheric ozone depletion because the ozone layer protects us from dangerous ultraviolet radiation. And then any novel entities that enter into the scene that the planet doesn't know how to deal with. So after they had identified these nine planetary boundaries, and remember, if we cross even one, we may not have a globalized civilization in the future. So they said, well, wait, if we know that there are nine with the current best knowledge, how are we doing? How many have we crossed? And this led to a major paper that was published in 2015 saying we had already crossed four of them climate change, biosphere integrity, land system change, and biogeophysical, biogeochemical flows. But then, of course, as new research was coming in and moving through the peer review process, they later confirmed in 2021 that we had also crossed the boundaries for freshwater use and ocean acidification. And then in 2022, they added novel entities for all of the microplastics that are so ubiquitous that they can be found in every glass of water and in the breast milk of every woman on earth. And that they are hormone disruptors and they cause problems with the development of different organisms and these microplastics are all over the planet. So what this tells us is that of the nine planetary boundaries, we've already crossed seven of them, which means we are in the midst of the breakdown of earth system processes. And I'll go into a little bit more detail to show you what this looks like. One thing that's happening right now is the Amazon basin is right on the edge of collapsing with unpredictable climate disruptions. The way that this works is that there's a combination of deforested area together with fragmentation of the forest that remains that is interrupting the hydrological flows that cause moisture to come from the Atlantic Ocean into the South American continent. And the current best estimates are that the Amazon will begin collapsing and being, begin a transformation into grassland savanna sometime between 2024 and 2026. So we're right on the edge of the full scale collapse of the Amazon rainforest. Another earth system that is being disrupted is called the thermohaline circulation or the great conveyor belt of the world ocean, which moves heat from the tropics to high latitudes and is very important for moderating and stabilizing weather systems. What's happening now is that the Greenland ice sheet is melting so quickly, dumping fresh water into the North Atlantic, that it's at risk of weakening and shutting down this great conveyor belt. And if this occurs, it will create turbulence in all of the weather systems of the world. And this actually happened about 12,000 years ago, near the end of the last ice age. So we have historical evidence that it could occur. We don't know when this one will occur now, although the thermohaline circulation is weakening, but it could be as early as 2030. And sometime in the next few decades, it's very likely to occur. Another thing that's happening is the four meter thick permafrost in the Siberian tundra is beginning to thaw. And as this frozen vegetation thaws, microorganisms begin to eat it and, and decompose it, releasing massive amounts of, of methane. Estimates are so high that if all of the permafrost were to melt, it could release the same amount of greenhouse gas warming as all of the industrial era caused by burning of fossil fuels combined, except it may happen as quickly as within one decade. And this is already occurring. These images here are pools of methane and there are exploded craters of methane throughout the Siberian tundra as this runaway effect is taking off and we know of no way to stop it. Another thing that's happening is that the human population has exploded in the last hundred years and it's corresponded with the degradation of ecosystems, destroying uh, intact ecosystems and creating degraded landscapes, which means it's accompanied by the emergence of a mass extinction event. And so right now the rate of extinction of non-human species is growing exponentially, keeping track with the growth in human population. Another thing that's happening in the Earth system is called the blue ocean event, which is when ice on the Arctic Ocean is completely melted during the summer. Ice reflects about 90% of the, of the sunlight back into space, whereas the ocean absorbs 90% of it. So as soon as we have our first summer in the Arctic Ocean with no ice, we'll have a dramatic increase in planetary warming and disruption of weather systems across the entire globe. 
This is now estimated to happen um, by the end of this decade. Another thing that's occurring is due to water scarcity because of these land system changes is that there is a growth in conflict and violence. And they're now saying that about 80% of all human conflicts in the last 70 years are associated with water scarcity or food scarcity connected with water scarcity. And so what this is telling us is that our human systems are being profoundly disrupted by these changes in the stability of the earth as a whole. Now, to give you a sense of how these interdependencies work, I wanna tell you a specific story about Sub-Saharan Africa, which you can see in this graph as the blue band just above the green part in the central part of Africa, below the Sahara Desert. This is the area that's called the Sahel, the Sahel Desert. And this is a very important part of a story that took place in the last century. Many of you are gonna be old enough to remember that there was a lot of starvation and hunger in Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So you remember all those starving kids we'd hear about? I was a child in the 80s when Suzanne Struthers was coming on and trying to raise money for all those starving kids. But do you know why they were starving? Do you know what happened? It took 50 years to find the answer, and I wanna share the answer with you now. What, the, what was discovered using what are called ocean atmosphere coupled general circulation climate models is that they found that between 1870 and 1940, sulfate aerosols were being released by the growing industrialism of Europe. This image you see here is the spread of sulfate aerosols. Uh, this is an image from NASA. This is the spread of sulfate aerosols today. And one thing you can see is that the aerosols from Europe are spiraling and spinning, and they go all the way down into the central and southern parts of Africa. What happened between 1870 and 1940 was that there were three cities, London, Paris, and Berlin, that began using coal to fuel all of their factories. And the coal that they were using had sulfur in it. When they burned this sulfurous coal, it created sulfate aerosols. The thing to know about sulfate aerosols is that when they're released into the atmosphere, they change the length of time that clouds remain in the atmosphere, which means they can have regional warming or cooling effects, depending on the type of cloud, how long it lasts, what elevation in the atmosphere that it is, and where it's moving, which latitude it is. It turned out that this increase in sulfate aerosols in Europe caused a displacement of storm tracks in Northern Africa, which then had an indirect effect of changing the storm tracks in sub-Saharan Africa. And the result was this, a very robust and stable monsoon pattern that existed in the Sahel Desert was turned off. What I want you to notice is the graph in the bottom where those green bars indicate the amount of rainfall. Notice that there was a very consistent rainfall pattern from 1950 up until about 1965, and then it began to weaken and by 1970, it shut off entirely. The shutdown of the Sahel monsoon caused agriculture in Sub-Saharan Africa to collapse, leading to wars, genocides, and mass starvation. The thing that people didn't know until about 2012 was that the Sahel monsoon was shut down by the burning of coal in the early industrial age of Europe. So this was invisible because as you can see, there was a chain of causation. There wasn't a simple cause-effect relationship. There was actually one thing caused another, which caused another, which caused another, in a cascading sequence of causes. It was spread out over a long period, or a long distance of about 8,000 kilometers um, from north to south, that it was delayed in time by almost 100 years, as you can see, the first burning of coal was in the 1870s and the shutdown of the Sahel monsoon occurred a century later. And the accumulation of sulfate aerosols had a delayed effect of several decades before the Sahel monsoon shut down. And there were interwoven narratives. There were different stories being told at the same time in different places. So it's really difficult to discern the reality of what was going on. And of course, there's actually a lot more than this. But the thing to recognize here is that the earth is a whole system. 
is a whole system with cascading relationships and with time delays. And everything is interdependent with everything else. Breakdown unfolds across space and time, and it is obscure in its causation, making it difficult and in some cases absolutely impossible to predict. So while these cascades can occur over long periods of time, over long distances, they can also occur simultaneously. There's the phenomenon known as multiple synchronous collapse. And there's a very powerful example of this from the year 2011. In 2011, in Tohoku, uh, Japan, there was a magnitude nine earthquake. The earthquake called, caused a tsunami. The tsunami flooded the Fukushima nuclear reactor, causing it to explode. The combination of the tsunami and Fukushima's explosion caused the shutdown of one of Toyota's primary manufacturing plants, causing them to need to displace and move the manufacturing to other places. Unfortunately, one of the places that they shifted their production was Thailand. And in Thailand, due to global warming, there was a thousand year flooding event. Flooding occurred throughout the entire country of Thailand over the span of several months, shutting down the other Toyota plants, meaning that the Toyota company um, lost 6 million units of car sales and something like 20% of Japan's GDP um, was lost in total from this event, and Toyota was hit very hard in the year 2011. All of these cascading events occurred within the span of about two months. So this is a multi-causation, multi-direction cascade of a sequence of collapses that couldn't have been predicted ahead of time. The reason that I tell you these things is that we need to manage risks that are spread out in space, time, and causation, or that the fragility and the interdependence can cause multiple synchronous cascading processes to occur very quickly. And this is what brings us to the part of the discussion about the design pathway forward. In the presence of such overwhelming complexity, what do we do about it? How do we manage it? How do we create resilience in the face of such incredible risks? The answer, at least initially, may be deceptive. The initial answer is to know that every one of these things occurs in a place. And so it's very important to know where you are. And right now, those of us in Toronto are right here. You can see that we're right there just above Lake Ontario in the North American continent. Now, why does it matter to know where we are? Because from where we are, we can create a tapestry of collaboration, a framework of partnerships and alliances that enables us to manage systemic risk together. And that's what we're going to talk about now. When we start to look at the places where we are, we need to understand the context we're working in. So when we zoom in to start to see where the greater Toronto area is located, we can see that it's embedded within the Great Lakes. So just as a little way of getting to know where we are, the question I'd like to ask us is, how much water is in the Great Lakes? Turns out that the Great Lakes hold 20% of all the fresh water on Earth. Now, some of you may know this, but some of you may not, that 99% of the water in the world is salt water. Only 1% of the water is fresh. And of that 1% of the water, 20% of it is in the Great Lakes. So just for a matter of perspective, this is the same amount of water as the entire Amazon rainforest. Nearly half of the fresh water on Earth is held in these two special places. So when we start asking ourselves about systemic risk, and systemic resilience, one thing we can notice is that the greater Toronto area is embedded within one of the most valuable strategic reserves on the planet, the fresh water of the Great Lakes. And this gives us a way to start feeling the significance of place. And so to talk about place in a, in a clear and technically clear, sort of a scientifically robust way, I want to introduce the concept of a bioregion. 
A bioregion, the word bioregion, is short for biological region. And what a bioregion is, is the entire context or the entire geography in which a life system can function for a biological population. Now to understand this, I like to use the starfish to show how it works. See, starfish have a very specific geography. They exist in something known as the intertidal zone. And in the intertidal zone, there are these tide pools and everything that's needed for the starfish to live is there. It's food, it's home, it's reproductive partners, everything that they need is in that place. So the biological region or the bioregion of the starfish is the intertidal zone. For human populations, it's a little bit more a little bit more complicated because of the way that we experience culture. We have a more sophisticated way of relating to landscapes, but the same basic idea applies. We can identify what is the bioregion in which a human culture is fully integrated and sustainable. And when we start to ask this question, we can see things in the landscape and ask, what is the role of a regenerative bioregion in tackling systemic risk? And part of it is to see that landscapes already organize themselves. They're already organized by the movement of water. This is a visualization of all of the river systems on the continent of Africa. So if someone was to ask, how do we regenerate and create systemic health for the entire continent of Africa? That seems absolutely overwhelming. But if you were to say, I am on this tributary of this river system that is one of the several hundred rivers of the African continent, then you could see that if every river was to restore its holistic health, that each place is a place from which to begin, that in parallel, we could move across the continent and regenerate the health of the entire continent. So the role of regenerative bioregions is to take the level of human culture that has been the most sustainable and integrated level of human culture, which is living within a landscape at a territorial scale with some degree of regional trade, which is how all hunter-gatherer societies have lived. And at that scale, we can see that there is like a patchwork quilt that can cover a network of landscapes to cover an entire continent. So the role of regenerative bioregions is to give us a holistic scale locally that we can organize ourselves around. And then to collaborate from one bioregion to another, we can move to higher levels of impact, such as regional or continental or even planetary scales. So if each bioregion is a whole system model for its own regeneration, it's an entire context for the life system of the population, then we could start to imagine a planetary network of human bioregions. And that planetary network is cultivating exchanges from one bioregion to another, sharing their learnings, engaging in trade, helping each other out to be able to regenerate their landscapes because everything is connected and interdependent within the earth. What we need to do is this. We need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, integrated life systems, and the thriving of families and communities. When you look at this map, which is colored based on ecotype, which means there are types of ecosystems that are constrained and largely determined by the types of soils, types of local climates, and type of ecosystems that exist within them that you can see that the local economies should be different in each place because they're different ecological contexts. So the idea here is that we can see how the land has already organized itself into watersheds and into ecosystem types, which means we can build from those and integrate with them to create sustainable local living economies. And this is an idea that is not new. In 1983, at the end of a 10 year period of very intense dialogue and intellectual debate about how human beings could live on a planet with planetary limits. There was a, a report that came out in 1983, authored by Dana Meadows, and several people were contributors to this essay. And when she, what she said was, 
She wanted to report on all of the learnings and 10 years of work with all of the major universities of the world to ask how could we live within planetary limits? And this is what came out. Vernon Rutten, who was an agronomist, said, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and resource endowment of each region. And then Dana Meadows went on to say, out of this came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. So this way of thinking about biological regions as the geography for creating sustainable economic systems and sustainable human cultures goes back many decades. If we start to think of a planetary network of regenerative bioregions, then we can see that by building strengths in a network of them enables us to create portfolios of our strategies where we might work across all of Central America or different bioregions that have similar types of landscapes. And this enables us to begin distributing the risk across this network of bioregions. It enables us to hold the diversity of projects and the innovation that comes from that diversity. It creates systems of collective learning where we can learn from one region to another how to do this deep, powerful, profound regenerative work. And it starts to build the infrastructure for bioregional economies as places that are further ahead help those that are further behind to catch up. And you can see this in the work that we're doing where I live. This is a map of uh, the, the country of Colombia. And what you see here are the mountains of the Northern Andes. The area that's there colored in in pink is a 500,000 hectare region that defines a regional climate system and a unique, ty unique type of ecology. It is the only high Andes tropical dry forest on earth. And it's also 95% deforested and rapidly becoming a desert. And we've been working in this region for several years with people who have been there for decades doing their own projects to create an integrated framework for the entire bioregion. And so here is a, just a little flavor of what we've been doing. What you can see here is a collection of local projects that have been unfolding within the territory around Barichara, Colombia. There are projects like Ojo de Agua, which is a community theater for teaching children about the story of their place and their history and to build up ecological knowledge and environmental connection. There are places like Casa Comun, which is creating a local economy and trade exchange for local producers who um, are farmers and people that create textiles and artists people have various different things to contribute to the local economy. There are projects like Ori Hindalagua, which is a nature reserve, taking degraded land and restoring native forest. Projects like Agua Santa, which is a network of agroforestry projects for food security and food resilience, that's building and strengthening soils while restoring watersheds and creating food security for the region, and so on. There are actually about 30 projects that we're working with. And we're helping these projects to come together, organized within the landscape itself. The basic metaphor for what we're doing is that we think of the land or the territory as a bank for regenerative investments. And in conceptual terms, you can think of it this way. The land is what can retain water and build soils. It can train people and provide livelihoods. It can cycle nutrients and create material flows for the local economy and the local ecology. It can provide housing and grow food for the people who live there. And all of these things enable the land as a bank to grow the capacities of local economies and weave them with other landscapes. So in short, this is a portfolio approach. We gather together a collection of projects within a landscape, or we gather up a collection of landscapes to collaborate together. And then we set up collaborative processes to weave the new and the existing efforts around the goal of whole earth regeneration. One very powerful way to think about this is if you were to imagine having a bioregional investment plan for a platform for the landscape where you live. Imagine a portfolio of projects organized around a specific territorial landscape 
And then you create robust circulation of values and benefits for the whole landscape by helping all of them to evolve together. Where we live in Barichara, Colombia, we're managing this by creating a community foundation that has a territorial focus. And it's interesting to know that the first community foundation ever created was in the 1920s in Cleveland, Ohio. And I, my understanding is that there's a foundation in Toronto, the Toronto Foundation, that's also a community foundation. So it's interesting to ask, could institutions such as these help to weave these local projects? Can local government do it? Can conservation planning authorities do it? Can local community groups do it? So that we manage and coordinate the learning up to the territorial scale. And so the way that I would say it is that there are four parts. You can see the little graphic here in the bottom. We have a territorial foundation, which just represents that there is governance for the collaborative process, however your territory might happen to do it. There's a bioregional learning center or a learning ecosystem. We have to share our learning and learn together to work at the scale of the entire landscape. And we do this with a portfolio of local projects, which grows, evolves, and changes with time. And then hidden within it, down in the middle of this image, is the pro-social capacities to collaborate and create and imagine and envision and navigate conflicts together to keep the whole system moving forward in the same direction. If you wanted to think of this in another way, you could imagine like this. Imagine if you had a dashboard for all of the information you would need to keep track of to follow a process like this where you would follow all of, all of the energy flows of the Earth system. There's rain and water, there's sunlight and energy, all kinds of things from the Earth. There are supply chains of human economies, the material flows within your territory and in the trade with other territories. There are nutrient cycles of the ecosystems and the landscape. And then there's the value creation that can occur by restoring the health and vitality and improving increasing and diversifying the quality of material flows, and that all of these could become integrated with each other at the landscape scale. Another way of thinking about this is that the portfolio approach allows you to manage systemic risk because you spread the risk out through a diversity of projects. You might have diversity in the different kinds of ecosystems and biodiversity that exists in different parts of your landscape. You may have different scales and complexity of projects, a small community garden or something that's restoring an entire watershed. You can have different cooperative structures and different regenerative goals. So you may have goals for restoring soil, for civic participation, for healing of cultural traumas, for decolonization and, learn and building better relationships with indigenous cultures. Whatever the regenerative goals may be, they'll each have their own cooperative structures. And a diversity of models means that you can experiment. Some will succeed and some will fail. And also you have projects with different stages of development. New projects that are just being imagined now, all the way through to projects that are decades old and that are very complex and mature. And this diversity held together enables you to create the resilience for managing systemic risk. So if you think about it this way, this Bioregional investment platform isn't simply a fund. It's actually a learning journey as everyone in the territory learns together how to work together, how to think and, and act together. And as they move toward their goals, they continually learn and share with each other. And they learn in a process of regenerative development, developing and shaping their economy, culture, and landscape around the living systems that are already a part of them and they weave toward an integration at a platform scale so that they can have sustained ongoing collaboration. And this can allow us to restore planetary health. How? Well, first you start with local projects. So in Barichara, we have this 10 hectare piece of land or we're creating a bioregional learning center to enable us to connect things across the territory. So this is for the work at 500,000 hectare scale in the Northern Andes of Colombia. But the important thing to know is that if we're gonna change what we do, we need to take these local projects and embed them in a fractal story of place. What the, the late Peter Berg said is that you can't really change what you do until you change your idea of who you are. And your idea of who you are should stem from the place where you are. 
And when I look at something like the Barichar Ecoversity or the uniqueness of the Great Lakes, I can see that Barichar Columbia is very different. The cultural identity there is not the same as it would be for the people of Toronto. So there would be different identities in those places. But both places are part of the earth. And we can have a shared identity as what Peter Berg called planetarians, which is a made up word. He liked to make up words. And it basically was to say that we're citizens of the earth. So we can be citizens of the earth and citizens of Toronto at the same time by understanding that each of our local projects have unique identity and stories of place, as well as shared identity across places. So the art and science of bioregions works like this that each bioregion has an ecological boundary in which it lives, but for humans, it also has a cultural identity. And when you put these together, what emerges is a coherent story of place. Every living being on earth has a story of place. Those starfish I talked about earlier may not be able to, to create words and tell stories or create YouTube videos, but I can guarantee you that if you go and watch and observe those starfish, they live out a story of the intertidal zone. They have a story of place. So the question becomes, do you know yours? Do you know your story of place? See, our personal stories are always connected to the reality that we exist somewhere. Our personal story is connected to where we are. And if we are born into a place, or if we migrate and travel and come to live in a place, we enter into a landscape that has a cultural history and an ecological history that is continually emerging in the present. And as members of the community living in that place, we are part of that story. And we can live into and give birth to a bioregional future by shaping how that story unfolds through our individual and our collective actions. And it's in this way that we can see how the local goes to planetary. So just like before with the continent of Africa that divides up into the partitioning of all of these watersheds, here's South America colored by its watersheds. And there's the Barichar Ecoversity that we're creating. And there's no way the Barichar Ecoversity could regenerate the entire continent. But if other people go into their own landscapes and start doing similar things, and we begin to collaborate with each other, then a continental regeneration process begins to emerge. We can go up and down the watersheds throughout the Amazon rainforest, the Andes mountain chain, and cover the entire continent with perhaps 200 bioregions. And this is how our local projects connect to the scale of a continent. So now let's go back to Toronto. In Toronto, you have a very special landscape. I was born in Missouri in the Ozarks, and we did not have anything like this giant sponge that you all have, which is the Oak Ridge Moraine. This is a sponge that was created over the period of two and a half million years as ice sheets ground up the rock to make gravel and sand. And just when I put on Wikipedia to learn about the Oak Ridge Moraine, I quickly discovered that it is the birthplace of 26 rivers including the five watersheds that move from north to south across the city of Toronto. You have this very unique landform with an absolute embarrassment of riches for the water in your landscape. So the question becomes, if the greater Toronto area begins to take leadership and build its capacity for working in this integrated bioregional scale, how could they help create resilience with all of the interdependencies of the rest of the world? The answer is to see that there's a larger scale system that Toronto is embedded within. And as Toronto is doing this work, they can begin to weave the waters by collaborating with other watersheds and other water forms. So Lake Ontario together with Lake Erie, Lake Huron and the other Great Lakes. They could also work with things like the Finger Lakes in upstate New York or other interesting landforms where they're connected to Lake Ontario. They might find sister cities to collaborate with, like in Cleveland, Ohio, which is already working with the Legacy Project. And the Legacy Project is 
the work that Brian and Susan are doing and they're working in the Toronto area. So how could the efforts for the bioregion of the Cuyahoga River and Cleveland, how could that collaborate with Toronto? And then of course you have the largest forest on earth, the boreal forest to your north. So how could you move out into these larger landscape patterns and share your learnings and collaborate with other places? Maybe they can do things that your local economy can't do to be able to build systemic resilience at a regional scale. What's interesting about this is when we go back out to the size of the continent and look at North America, once again, the continent is defined by the movement of water. Just look at all those watersheds. And if you have people organizing in the Great Lakes as a network of local bioregions, notice what happens is you go all the way west in Lake Huron. And you get to the westernmost tip of Lake Huron and you're in Duluth, Minnesota. And Duluth, Minnesota is the birthplace of the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River covers 40% of the continental United States. It's a massive body of water connected to several river systems. So we could imagine this moving outward to create regional resilience for the Great Lakes and then collaborating with people up and down the Mississippi Basin. By the, by the way, the Ohio River comes all the way over through Pennsylvania into New York. The Missouri River goes all the way to Montana. The Arkansas River goes all the way to Colorado. The Mississippi River goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And those of you who know your regional history, the Algonquin peoples of Toronto traded and received seashells from the Gulf of Mexico and from the Atlantic seaboard because boats moved up and down the Mississippi River and across the Great Lakes. So there's actually a historical precedent of a 12,000 year period of stability for trade networks across the North American continent. And what I'm describing here is that this bioregional approach allows you to treat your local landscape holistically and help other landscapes to do the same and then collaborate across them up to the continental scale. If we create bioregional networks on every continent, this is how it is possible to regenerate the earth. So how might you imagine bioregional learning centers in the greater Toronto area? What would they look like? What institutions and capacities do you already have that are able to learn, think, and act in this way? Well, for what we're doing in Bari Chara, just to give you a, an example of how to think about this, what we're doing in Bari Chara, Colombia, is we've identified territorial patterns of regeneration that we're working with. I think these will all look familiar to what you're doing in the greater Toronto area. For one thing, we're focusing on the restoration of entire watersheds setting up community water councils, member-owned aqueducts, and other ways of restoring the watersheds. We've created a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry to spread reforestation practices, to rebuild soils, and to create all the materials we need for a local economy, because agroforestry systems can create textiles, medicine, food, construction materials. Most of the things you need for an economy can be grown in a forest. We're work is working on transforming the local food systems to be more localized and resilient. So we've, been, we've established a community market with local food growers. This is similar to the way that a farmer's market might work. And we're working on the design and experimentation for alternative economic models, investigations in solidarity and community exchange and keeping financial flows in the local economy and doing the opposite of what the global economy does, which is that outside investors invest in local places and then extract the resources and the profits. Bioregional models are about, about creating strong local and regional economies. A framework that can help us understand how to do this was developed by the Common Land Foundation. Common Land Foundation is currently working with 16 landscapes and a growing number. And each landscape is at least 100,000 hectares in size. And they work for at least 20 years and they have a framework for integrated landscape management that they use to help them do this. We're adopting this landscape approach in our work in Colombia. And the way the framework works is like this. They call it the 54320 model. And basically they identified five processes for landscapes, which these processes need to run over a period of 20 years. 
One of them is establishing a landscape partnership that is then able to reach a shared understanding of what the landscape is, how it came to be the way it is, and scenarios of the future to move toward. And then there's a selection of a landscape plan. And then the landscape partnership ensures the effective implementation of the plan, and they develop continually improving monitoring and learning frameworks as they go. They're able to combine this with a very clear language for four different returns that they can talk about to investors to help them step into this process. So financial returns are present, but alongside them are natural returns, just ecological benefits, social returns, general improvement in economic and social well-being, and also the most profound of all, the return on inspiration in storytelling, engagement, and participation. This approach also takes an understanding that the landscape can be divided into three different kinds of zones to create an integrated understanding of the landscape as a whole. There can be a natural zone, which is set aside for conservation, a combined zone where ecological benefits are being achieved while also creating economic outcomes. This might be regenerative agriculture or agroforestry as examples. And then that there can be an economic zone like the urban center that is able to densify and build itself in a more coherent way because of the transfer of development rights with the other zones. This model is really powerful because it is mirrored by the much more familiar large scale infrastructure project. So if you were to build something like a regional light rail system, you might find $2 billion, develop a 30-year plan, hire a project management team that then subcontracts out to lots of other groups, and then spends the $2 billion with all of the returns coming in over the period of 30 to 40 years. With that as a mental model, we can think of landscapes in the same way that there needs to be a core team that is setting up the landscape partnership and managing the landscape processes. Common Land Foundation has found that the core team needs to be funded at a level of about $2 million per year. But then there's a whole bunch of regenerative projects that are integrating and restoring the health of the entire landscape and building the regenerative economy. And they found that two to three times as much money per year needs to be invested in creating an ecosystem and an integration of these regenerative projects. Notice that this is that portfolio approach that manages systemic risk. And what they found in practice with the landscapes they've worked with is that regenerative economies really start to take hold and regenerative businesses become profitable about eight to 10 years into the process. And in their experience, local governments don't really understand this model until after it's been demonstrated and they don't start supporting this regenerative economy until it's starting to emerge. Now that can be leapfrogged by understanding the model and having seen it in other landscapes, which is what a lot of the work of the Common Land Foundation is right now. But the important thing to see here is that this is a way of managing a landscape fund that someone could invest $500 million in their bioregion maintaining a landscape partnership with several landscape processes, funding the development of the innovation ecosystem for the emergence of a stable regenerative economy so that the regenerative economy generates the revenue returns, the tax base for the government, for the government to reinvest those returns back in the community as part of the ecosystem. And that this happens on a scale of at least 100,000 hectares or larger, for a minimum of 20 years. This is a large scale infrastructure project and it has been demonstrated now in 15 landscapes by the Common Land Foundation. The work we're doing in Barichara is joining and becoming part of this group and perhaps Toronto would be interested in the future. So the critical question is this, is there enough interest and enough commitment to attend future meetings and expand into a discussion of bioregional learning centers landscape funds, and this general approach we're talking about. If there is interest, if you are interested, I recommend you talk to Brian and Susan at the Legacy Project because they're gonna be holding meetings on exactly this topic. But I'm here in Toronto with my partner, Penny. This week and next week, we're traveling through the Great, Le Great Lakes on a tour of bioregional activation. We're in the greater Toronto area this week. Next week, we go to New York, to Binghamton and Ithaca, and then we're going to Cleveland, and then we're going back to Rochester, and then we're flying back to Columbia at the end. 
And the idea is we want to stimulate this kind of thinking and dialogues for the Great Lakes as a whole, starting with the leadership that we're seeing in the greater Toronto area. And at a larger scale, we're building a design school for regenerating Earth, which of course is informed by everything we're learning in Barichara and building a planetary network of bioregions. And the legacy project is partnered with us to be in the first cohort of bioregions, which is why we're here in Toronto now, right at the beginning of this process. And our goal is to create a network of 500 to 1000 bioregions by the end of this decade that is doing this work collaboratively and that is sharing its learnings from one landscape to another. And so the question I have for you is are you ready to become an earth regenerator, to actually scale upward from local effort to regional collaboration, to continental scale, to the scale of the entire planet, grounded and rooted in where you are? So can you organize yourselves into a bioregion in the way that I've just described? That's something I'd like to talk with you about now. And so, as you can see with this vision, that this is something that is incredibly complex, has a lot of different parts to it, and that it's going to involve a lot of collaboration. And the reason that I'm sharing it with you now is that these systemic risks are intensifying and accelerating on a daily basis. And the need for us to learn how to collaborate at these larger scales is greater than ever before. One thing that I think is really important is uh, is just for us to hold the importance of staying in the complexity. So often we are, are either taught or told or demanded to simplify and make it manageable. But the reality is if this was manageable, we wouldn't be in this mess. And so we have to learn how to manage what is overwhelming. Like if it's overwhelming, how do you manage yourself when you're overwhelmed? You may not manage the thing overwhelming you, but you can learn to manage yourself. Part of the challenge of dealing with complexity is to stay in it, to know how to stay in the complexity. And so I wanna thank you all for staying with me through the complexity, because I was very intentional that I didn't want to reduce it and simplify it. I wanna really hold what, you know, what the challenges are, how the scale and the scope and the intensity of the challenge. And also, the scale and the scope and the possibility of living in a different way in our local landscapes and how powerful that can become. And so um, I wanna thank you, Brian and Susan, who I know is not on camera, uh, for inviting us to participate. I wanna thank you all for being here today. Uh, I just wanna say to everybody that um, there is a great amount of interest. We have partners with the city of Markham with library systems, with the school system, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, and we have uh, potential partners in the city of Toronto and town of Caledon and other municipalities. The bioregional approach is striking a chord, and we invite you to contact us for more information. This information session today is a starting point, and there is a lot of uh, different parts to the seven generation greater Toronto bioregional initiative. One thing that I can mention is that we're doing a session on social regeneration, including social prescribing Friday morning and how that ties in. My background actually, I'm an energy engineer, I used to work for BC Hydro, Ontario Hydro on energy efficiency programs. So one of the things we're gonna be looking at is how do you get a neighborhood approach to home retrofits, regenerating existing homes and buildings. And we have a number of ideas in that area that we're gonna pursue across the generations. So that is uh, something that we can talk about further as well. So I'll leave you with that thought and thank you all for coming today and participating. And I look forward to connecting further.